Welcome to our last uh, panel discussion of the day titled Communication and Public Trust. I'm Brandon Lausch, I'm Director of Public Affairs at Temple University. I wanted to thank uh, Michelle Masucci, our Vice President for Research at Temple, who you heard from earlier in her office for the invitation to speak to our uh, distinguished guests. Uh, being from Temple, I could just hop on the subway and get up here, and the story was quite different for, the, for these folks, so we appreciate uh, their, the time and effort it took to, to get here. Uh, in order, we have Dr. For Christopher Labos, who's an associate in the Office for Science and, and uh, Society at McGill University in Montreal. Next to him is Jennifer Poulakidis, who is Vice President for Congressional and Governmental Affairs at APLU, that's the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. And at the end of the table is Ed Kara, science writer and health reporter for Gizmodo. And what I'm hoping to do is that each of our panelists could take a few minutes to introduce themselves and the perspectives from which they uh, encounter this issue, communication and public trust. And then uh, we'll have some guided questions for some time and then open it up to the full audience to end our day. And then we'll celebrate with the reception. Okay. Take it away. Uh, hi, as you heard, my name is Christopher Labos. I'm actually a cardiologist by day. I'm a science communicator by night. I also find some time to do research somewhere in there, and I'm not exactly sure how. Uh, and what's interesting, and I hope something that we're going to get across in this discussion now, is that I see science communication from both ends of the spectrum, from the person who produces research, who tries to communicate the science, and as the person who's trying to communicate other people's science to the public. And so I think I've seen quite a few of the problems that go into bad science communication, which is one of the things that we try to combat at the Office for Science and Society. Our, our mandate is to separate sense from nonsense and to try to get the information to people so that they can tell the difference between good science communication and bad science communication. And that's really what, what we try to do there. Hi, I'm Jennifer Poulakidis with the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. APLU is an association of um, all the land grant universities across the, across the country and also all the other big public research universities. Um, about 200 here in the US and about a half dozen in, um, in Canada and another half dozen in Mexico. So we're now a North American association. Um, we are interested, and in, in my work there is um, congressional and governmental affairs. So APLU is interested in this issue at, at a variety of levels, I would say, our, our vice presidents for research are talking about this pretty constantly. Um, they're interested in um, scientific integrity and how the communication of science impacts public perceptions of science. Um, and from a government relations perspective, uh, I'm, I'm interested in it because how the public perceives science um, helps uh, influence how Congress perceives science. Uh, so, um, so the the issue of science communication and um, and public trust in science is certainly important for um, for the work that we do. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Ed Caro. I'm a journalist with Gizmodo, and uh, you know I would describe myself as uh, as a journeyman reporter at this point. I've been doing it for about less than three years, and the the way I've come to understand what I do is is to be sort of a Sherpa. Uh, for the reader in navigating the, and the complicated thing that is science. You know, it, it's, to me it's just a matter of, of making people understand what does matter, what will matter, and what should matter to you as a person in, in the everyday world. That's great. All right, Chris, if we could start with you. Yeah. Let's assume everyone in the audience conducts amazing science, gets top tier journal publications, <laughs> but may encounter pitfalls or challenges communicating that to wider audiences. Yeah. So what are some concrete steps some researchers in the audience could, could take to communicate their findings as, as broadly and as effectively as possible? Yeah, I, I think the best thing that you can do when you produce research is, the, the first thing you should do is speak to the people in your universities or your organization's PR department. Because most universities, most departments are gonna put out a press release um, once a study is published, not everyone, but most, right? Um, the thing I would encourage you to do is speak to them, get to know them. But most importantly, also ask them if you can read the press release before they send it out. One of the big things that, I've, that I have seen when you know, looking at how science is, is portrayed in the media is that a lot of times press releases can use um, unjustifiable language. They'll use what we, use, what we tend to refer to as the uh, dirty words in science communication, 
breakthrough, game changer, miracle. Uh, you know, not every study can be a breakthrough study. Not every study can be a game changer. And yet you see these words come up a lot. So, and what often happens is that if you look at the press release of a study and look at what was actually written in the scientific paper, I mean, there's quite a discrepancy sometimes. The you know, paper is usually a little bit more nuanced. Most researchers understand that the results are hypothesis generating. They say more research is needed. They'll put a few caveats in the paper. Um, and the press release, which is what most journalists are going to see, at least as, as, as a first line, um, can sometimes be a lot more optimistic than the actual study suggests. So if your goal is to put out accurate scientific information, work with your PR department, look at the press release first, and at least at that stage in the process, because there's multiple steps to science communication, but at least at that, at that step, you as a scientist can probably stop some of the tendencies that we do see in science communication in the media is to sort of exaggerate the significance of a lot of the claims that are being made. Ed, uh, to, to pivot to you, how, how do you make uh, judgment calls for, for news value when a uh, miracle study lands on your desk? <laughs> I, well, the minute that word comes anywhere near a uh, press release, you just, you already tend to have a skeptical eye towards it. You, you should, at least. Um, you know, to me, it, it, we all, at least in, in within Gizmodo, you know, we have our little specialties. So, like, I, I will tend to go towards public health, diseases, outbreaks. Uh, so, once something is in that orbit, then I'll look at it. Um, Personally, I understand why journalists rely on press releases so much. You know, it, there's just, the news cycle is, is so rapid and there's so little time and, you know, there's just so much pressure on you to, to, to write. Um, to me, I, I use the press release only as, as a guiding post. You know, I, I, will, I will glance at it and then I will look at the paper itself first. Uh, and if I can help it, I will, I will not reference any language used in the press release if I can, but that's me, you know, that, that's someone I do, uh, I th I'm probably a little bit more nitpicky than, than other journalists might be. Uh, so to me, you know, it's just, I think it comes down to the, the, the coolness of the study. You know, if it, it doesn't necessarily have to be miracle, or it doesn't have to be a groundbreaking study, but if there's, if there's some value that I can either, that is either important to the reader or that I think the reader would be able to appreciate if I was able to communicate it effectively, that's generally what would be the, the make or break in picking a study to, to write about. Okay. One more question for you, Ed. Mm -hmm. In putting together sort of the formula of, of an effective, compelling story, what other sources beyond the institution or the researcher do you rely on to maybe frame it or contextualize it or react to it? Other scientists, you know, much, much like you guys do. Uh, I, I have and I like building a base of journalists knowledgeable in whatever field I'm covering in. Uh, you know, and they can, I can send them an email, I can send them a text, the phone, a phone call, just let them see if it passes the sniff test. Uh, there's also, you know, a lot of resources that have been, have been coming up in the last few years that allow journalists to reach out to outsourced sources. I think uh, Sideline is something that just came up, uh, I think, in 2017. Uh, that's a resource I'd like going to. And, uh, yeah, I'm like just reaching out to other people and letting them, you know, just give them a little bit of insight themselves to me. Jen, for, oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I just want to jump into one thing. So just to, to follow up on that, one of the big issues that I found, I found because like I said, I sort of do this from, from both sides of the aisle. Uh, I sometimes write articles for the lay press, for the you know, newspapers and the media up in Canada. And I find it very, very hard to get my colleagues to give interviews. And I usually have to, you know, and I'm very flexible in the timelines. I have that, that, that luxury that most other journalists don't. But I've noticed that a lot of researchers are very, very scared to give media interviews. And some people don't do it because of time constraints, I understand that. But a lot of people genuinely don't do it out of fear. Uh, and there's a great reluctance to go on the record. And I think people are scared of that. And I don't think you should be. I think um, there are certainly bad journalists, just like there are bad researchers. But the majority of journalists genuinely want to hear what you have to say. And they will incorporate what you have to say in the article because it will make it a better article. And so I, I would encourage people to be more open with their time uh, when people are asking them for interviews. Now, you know, we, we all complain about bad science communication. I complain about it a lot. Uh, I'm actually part of an organization called Health News Review, which unfortunately is losing its funding in December, but its, or its goal was to review how science is portrayed in the media and to look at how various media sources cover scientific topics. Um, 
And, and one of the things that we, we, we judge stories on is do they have an outside independent source to say if the study is valid or not? But the only way you're gonna do that is if people volunteer their time. So if you care about good science communication, the thing I would urge you to do is to volunteer your time when somebody asks you for an interview. So speaking of that, uh, that maybe a aversion a little bit, speaking with reporters, I'm sure, Jen, you, you encounter maybe some of the same aversion if you wanna go to the Hill and maybe provide testimony or, advocate a researcher to, to advocate for, for research funding or a program. So how do you overcome some of those challenges or maybe prepare researchers to speak to governmental officials? Um, I think it, it really can cut both ways. There are, there are scientists who are shy about um, uh, approaching policymakers or going to the Hill, and then there are others who you know, are interested in having those communications all the time. Um, what's, what's, I think, important for, for both is being prepared and, um, and not, not bringing your slide deck of um, 50 PowerPoints to show your member of Congress or, or the staff person that you're gonna be visiting with, but rather developing a story around your research and, and making it compelling, just as Ed does for his reader, you've gotta make your, your story compelling to the person you're, um, you're engaging. Um, in, in this case, the policymaker. Um, uh, we, we talked about, um, actually I think it was Brian talked about the importance of, of stories and storytelling and, um, uh, and, and that, that connection, um, connecting your research to the member of Congress, either because they have, someone in their family suffers from a particular disease or they have always had an interest in um, in chemistry or whatever that might be, that tie is what's going to stick with, um, with the policymaker and the member of Congress and help them recognize the importance of the science that they are supporting with federal funds. Any points to add about storytelling? What makes effective, an yeah. effective story? Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, we might bring this up later, but I was just looking back at some of the, the most read articles I've personally made at Gizmodo, uh, and I've been there for less than a year. And, you know, a lot of it tends to be what you would expect, kind of like bizarre medical tales, uh, you know, people getting worms stuck in their eyes, you know, that tends to bring a lot of eyeballs to, to the crowd. Um, but the most read article I, I made uh, at Gizmodo so far, it was just a, a simple article detailing a study looking at, at a painkiller that, that may have uh, higher risks for heart disease or heart, heart, uh, heart problems. Uh, for a painkiller that isn't even, even widely used in the US, and, and, you know, and it got millions of views because you know, that, is a, that is a relevant issue to the public. You know, everyone deals with pain, everyone worries about their heart. I think, I think there, there, is a, there is an opportunity to make compelling issues make issues that might not seem, that might seem a little dry, more compelling. And I think that's, that's a responsibility that, that we as journalists have, uh, that we can coordinate with uh, science and scientists and uh, you know, the PR people. The, the only trouble I have with the idea of storytelling, and I, and I understand why that has to happen. You have to make it engaging. You have to give people a face to associate with the story. My only problem with it, and it's something that I have a lot of friends who are in journalism, and I, it's something I bring up with them, is that you have to be careful about becoming too fixated on the idea of anecdotes, because anecdotes are not evidence, right? I think everybody in this room understands that, and yet those things get confused a lot when it comes to science communication, especially in the media. And I'll give you a great example of how this happened. The Toronto Star, which is one of the national newspapers in Canada, did a story a few years ago now, and the title, this was on their front page above the hole, this was the banner headline, and it was the dark side of, that, of a vaccine. Hmm. And it was a story, you, you know the story, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This was a terrible, terrible story. The title was the dark side of a vaccine, and it was the story of uh, these six young women, I think there were six young women who died shortly after getting the HPV vaccine. And so the thrust of the story was that the HPV vaccine might be dangerous, we don't know. And you know, four paragraphs down, they actually had the line that like, granted, the scientific evidence shows that the HPV vaccine is completely safe. And then they went back to chronicling the story of these six young women who died and how tragic we are, how tragic it was, and they had these you know, pictures of these attractive girls and the grieving parents, and it was a great story. 
The problem was it wasn't true, right? The HPV vaccine is safe. We have how many hundreds of thousands of doses have been delivered over the course of the years where it's out there? The, and so the Toronto Star had this very, very intense blowback from the scientific community. Many people criticized it. Rather than apologizing, the editorial board subsequently doubled down and started accusing the people criticizing them of being... Uh, there was one famous line which is, the editor of the Toronto Star told the journalist, look, stop criticizing us, write your own story, Start, stop gargling with our bathwater. Um, it was an odd statement to make, and it really cemented how sort of perverse the discussion became. They ended up having to, have, having to retract the story. And I think that was the first time ever that a Canadian newspaper had to retract a front page story. And in their retraction letter, they actually went and they tried to justify and they said, no, we weren't saying the vaccine was dangerous. We were trying to highlight how difficult it is to show vaccine safety and about how the vaccine safety process works in Canada. And then they had the throwaway lines like, we acknowledge that we sort of confused the issue between anecdotes and evidence. And so that's the real problem. So I understand that to tell a good story, to sell newspapers, to get people engaged, you need an anecdote, you need that personal hook but it should never come at the expense of evidence. And I think that's where the real danger lies when we ignore the evidence, because then you go around and saying things like, hey, the HPV vaccine is dangerous, when it you know, very clearly is not. I have to completely agree with, with Chris that an anecdotes can end up being dangerous and, and backfiring. Um, uh, while they, they can be compelling, um, uh, oftentimes policy is made on the back of anecdotes. That's, that's not helpful. We want policy to be made on the back of evidence. Um, and and I, should, I should have clarified um, that for when I talk about creating a story, making a story um, as, you, um, a, as you approach policymakers and members of the public, it's not about talking about an anecdote. It's about connecting your research in, in a larger way to, uh, to, to what's real to that person. Um, and um, I think um, a, a fun <clears throat> um, program that APLU and many other organizations in Washington and, and elsewhere are, are involved in right now is, um, is a, a program called the um, Golden Goose Awards. Um, we have a, a re recent recipient of a Golden Goose Award with us today. Um, uh, Brian Nosek received the award just last week or the week before, um, very recently. Um, and, and what the Golden Goose Awards do is they take um, federally funded science that, uh, that might sound obscure and maybe not really worth uh, the taxpayer's uh, dollar they take that, that initial research that then has grown to have a significant societal impact and they, they detail how that happened. Um, and, um, and so the Golden Goose Awards is a, a, a play on the Golden Fleece Awards, which was an award that a, a senator from Wisconsin, long, long gone now, used to um, uh, offer up to uh, wasteful federal spending. So this is, this is in fact federal spending that um, has not gone awry, but in fact has, has granted us the, uh, you know, a, a golden egg. Hmm. Yeah, I like to say science at its heart is, is a series of long, often dry steps towards something. And sometimes that something is nothing. And sometimes it is something. And finding a way to, to, to tell that journey in an entertaining and nuanced way, you know, that, that is the responsibility of science journalists. Uh, and, and for many reasons, sometimes we fall flat. Uh, so yeah, so it doesn't, doesn't have to be anecdotes, but I think people, I think sometimes we underestimate how much people appreciate science and appreciate the, the work that goes into that. You, you know, my reader, you know, especially in Gizmodo, uh, a lot of commenters are, are pretty, pretty, pretty into science already. And, you know, they know the, the journey has a, lot of, had a lot, has a lot of false ends. Uh, so, you know, I, I give my readers a lot more credibility when I, when I write. I don't try to dump things down. I don't try to, to avoid uh, was it limitations. You know, I'll discuss that very openly. Uh, a lot of mays and shoulds and mights. You know, I, I'll be honest with my readers about the uncertainty of science. And I think a lot of times people tend to think of uncertainty as bad. 
uh, you know, the, especially the, comp, the, the public. Uh, so I think it's, it's our responsibility to, to convey that uncertainty doesn't have to be bad, it can be good, and it can just be neutral. Let's talk about that a, a little bit further, sort of the, the incremental progress within scientific discovery and how headlines may look or feel perhaps splashier than, than the evidence of whatever study that's put in front of you. So let's talk a little bit about balancing sort of the immediate need to maybe get a media placement or secure funding with contextualizing what exactly occurred. I mean, we talk sort of about the miracles at, at one end, but what are other ways in which you can sort of appropriately frame this um, and still get what you want out of it, but sort of, sort of balance the, the immediate needs with the, with the overall landscape? So I, I think the first thing you have to realize about how people consume media nowadays, um, when it comes to any story, most people are gonna read the title, uh, a small percentage of people will read the first paragraph, and it's only a very small minority of people who are gonna read all the way to the end, mm -hmm. okay? So if you're trying to get a point across, your thesis statement, your first sentence, your first paragraph has to be where you put all the information. So um, you know, if you're writing an article for uh, the lay press or for any other uh, publication, what you write in the first paragraph is going to be key. I think what we often forget, though, is that especially for traditional media, um, this is changing a little bit, I think, but most journalists don't write their headlines, right? You're, the headline in a newspaper is not written by the person who wrote the article. So I think we have to be a, a little bit forgiving of journalists when the headline is maybe a little bit off, and this has happened to me when I write for the Montreal Gazette. I don't choose my own headlines, and sometimes I look at it and I say, oh, God. <laughs> Um, but you, you, I think this is changing a little bit, and this happened to a colleague of mine, um, Yanni Friedhoff, who's in Ottawa. He does a lot of nutrition uh, research, and he wrote an article about milk, and the headline was something along the lines of, like, milk is dangerous. And he went on Twitter and said to them, he's like, that is not what I wrote in the article. You need to change that. So uh, I think we need to get away from the traditional model, which is journalists write the articles and the editorial people write the headlines. I think that is changing. Maybe you can correct yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, there is a lot more, at least uh, in online media, you know, what I've done, there's a lot more cooperation between the editor and, and, the, and the journalists. So I will, I will generally give my blessing to the headline. Um, which is not the way it was a generation ago. Yeah, yeah. A I generation ago, as a journalist, you had no input into what the headline was going to be. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example about how the headline can sort of veer people during, during the, uh, the wrong way. I wrote an article for the Montreal Gazette about um, beauty products. Now, the article wasn't actually about beauty products. What I was trying to make the case for was that most beauty products don't have any evidence base behind them. You're basically buying expensive Vaseline that's scented. Um, so, you know, 20, a $20 bottle, $20 bottle, they're basically doing the same thing. And so, and, but the, the point of the article was that I said that the best beauty product is sunscreen because most of the skin damage, most of photo aging, most of wrinkles that we see are due to sun exposure and that the best beauty product you can have is sunscreen, which is why most makeups and beauty products now for women have SPF factors built into them. But in the way I wrote the story, these are short articles, they're meant to be consumable for the general public, but I didn't mention sunscreen in the first paragraph. And after the article came out, because I have my email at the end of every article, I was inundated by emails, inundated. I mean, usually people don't email me, I'll get one or two articles. I got maybe 50 emails about this, and they all had the same question, what is the best beauty product? And like, it's in the article. The article was 650 words long. Like, it shouldn't have taken you that long to read. People don't read to the bottom of articles anymore. It says, so what is the best beauty product? And I have to explain to them, no, it's sunscreen because it's not really a beauty product. It's about be careful of sun exposure because we don't understand it. People still suntan in the whole thing. But, um, you know, it, it, so the key to science communication is about getting the headline because the truth is that's what most people are not going to, you know, that's what most people are, are, are going to read. And this may not be something that you, do if you're just communicating your research uh, to journalists, but the way that you should do it is to get that one main point out there and keep repeating yourself. It is okay to repeat yourself to journalists because they're gonna ask you different things and they're asking you because they honestly don't know. They're asking you about this, this aspect, this aspect. If there's one point that you think is important, you keep saying it. And most journalists at the end of an interview will ask you, so is there one point that you'd like me to get across? You'd say, yes. Vaccines do not cause autism. You, know, you get that one main thesis statement out there because that's the one that will probably go in the nut graph or the first paragraph, and that's, the, that's what most people are gonna take away from any article that focuses on your research. Yeah, I mean, I will, I will always ask the researcher what they want the public to understand about their work. 
and you know, at, and that's that's really the most important thing. Like we we want we want scientists to 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 tell us things. We want we trust science. You know, despite how it might seem sometimes, we trust science more than any other institute except the military. Uh, trust more than journalists. So you know, the public wants scientists on their side. They want them to to tell them things. Uh, and you know, we a lot of people don't read articles, which is is is, a, is just a mind. Uh, messes with your mind, just uh, if you think about it too much as a journalist. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so we, we rely on scientists to, to do the work for us, and, and we just need to find a way to, to convey, you know, what, what they do in, in, you know, that short bite, that short news bite. And another question for you, we, we've talked a lot about sort of how we can all work together in our ecosystems to a common goal, clarity of understanding, con context, et cetera. But could you describe maybe some tensions you feel with the scientific community uh, and maybe some do's and don'ts of how to uh, approach a reporter like you? Sure. Well, you know, at, at the heart of it, we do want the truth. The journalists want to report the truth. Scientists want to find truth. Uh, but, you know, there are so many pressures in both our fields that kind of kind of butt heads of each other. You know, a university that is sending a press release, like, you know, they, they, I'm sure they like science, but they, they want their science to be, to be noticed, to be publicized, for the public to, to pay attention to them, because that might mean more funding. Um, my, my interest is not to, to be a fan of science, though I am. My job is to report the best available information on a study or on research or on an agenda ongoing in science. So sometimes, you know, that, that is how you get those press releases that are, that are very, that tend to be a little misleading or, or tend to overemphasize things. Uh, you know, and it's my, ideally, as a journalist, it, it should be my job to question science, to question scientists, the work that they produce, to ensure that we are getting the most factual uh, version of events that's going on. And that can, definitely, that can definitely not go well sometimes. Let me ask you a question. Because this happens a lot to me when I'm giving interviews and getting interviews. Mm -hmm. So I often feel that sometimes scientists and, and journalists are sort of approaching the problem from different perspectives and different mindsets because of the culture of where we operate. And so let me ask you a question. A scientist asks you after you give the interview, can you email me the quotes you're going to use? Because I want to fact check them before you publish them. Yeah. <laughs> I think this has happened to you because it's happened yeah. to me many times. Yeah. And I think it's fascinating because it reflects the different points of view, right? Journalists want to maintain their prof professional integrity. And they don't want people looking over their article. Their article is their work. They right. don't want to have outside influences. They don't want people sort of changing their response based on what's there. And I understand that. And scientists are approaching it from like, well, why won't you see me the quotes? Why don't you want me to proofread stuff? We're used to the idea of peer review where you send an article around like 15 different times through a mass email chain and everybody keeps changing it. <laughs> um, and so I think, and I think that's, I think a lot of the reason why scientists are sometimes reluctant to speak to journalists, they're always a little bit worried are they going to be taken out of context or whatnot. And I think we just have to understand that we have this, these different approaches and we have to try to find some way to be more forgiving of, of, of our differences. So I don't know what your solution yeah. to that problem is. Uh, if, if it's an article or if it's a topic that I am, I am not, that is, you know, completely out of my, out of my woods, I will, I will sometimes, occasionally, I will go over what they've spoken to me about and I will recite it back to them to make sure that I understand what they are coming from. Uh, for longer, in, like a longer form article, I will, some, I will usually go over the quotes with them just to make sure that it, what they're saying is accurate and so will the fact checker. Um, but I mean, it, it does come down to this trust in one another. You know, we've all met, we've all seen bad science journalism, and we've all seen bad scientists. And I think this just that we need to be able to to bridge that gap. And I, you know, I wish I knew exactly how. But yeah. I, I think another thing too is that you have to realize when people are joking, and be careful when you're giving an interview to make jokes. And I'll give you a great example. I don't know how many people remember the chocolate Nobel Prize study that was published in New England a few years back now. Uh, it was actually just a research letter, but basically what happened was, I think the first author was Miss Surly, if I remember the name correctly, but basically the story is this. He was at a conference, he went back to his hotel room and had this idea about chocolate and Nobel Prizes, went on Wikipedia, found the number of Nobel Prizes per country, found the average chocolate consumption per country, plotted a straight line on a graph and said, hey, the line is straight, sent it to the New England. It got published <laughs> and the press release went out. 
And when I first heard about it, I was convinced that this was, you know how sometimes like the BMJ has like the Christmas articles that are jokes and like nobody realizes it, so the news reports it, you know, like, you know, the James Bond would have, li would have liver failure if he drank that many martinis. <laughs> like these are joke articles that people don't realize are jokes, but yet they get covered by the media sometimes. I thought this was a joke article, but this was an honest to goodness, honest, uh, honest study and it was published. And so this went out through the Associated Press and so they interviewed some uh, physicist, I think at Cornell, and uh, his quote was, um, and obviously he didn't think it was a real study either because he basically said to the journalist, well, look, you know, listen, uh, milk chocolate might be fine if you want a Nobel Prize in chemistry or medicine or whatever, but if you want a Nobel Prize in physics, you really have to go with the dark chocolate. <laughs> that was his quote. The AP journalist oh, no. published it, sent it out over the wire, went everywhere, he had to apologize for making fun of people in chemistry and medicine. So <laughs> I feel like I'm undercutting my point here because I'm trying to tell you guys to trust journalists and to be out there. Um, this is sort of an extreme example of people who obviously didn't understand where humor was at play here. So um, I, 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 I <laughs> I love that story because it makes me laugh. But this is what you have to do. You, you, you know, when you're giving an interview, it is like writing an article. Be serious, be factual, be to the point, be brief. Get the information across you want to. Um, you know, avoid making jokes because that's where sometimes things can cause problems. But, and make sure you have a relationship with the journalist. If, you know, once journalists know that you're willing to help them, they will keep coming back to you. Uh, now, maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing, maybe you feel like you don't have the time, but you know, once you build a relationship with journalists, you're gonna see that once you help them, they will produce better articles. And the goal, like I keep saying, you see, I keep repeating myself, that's how you do good science communication, is to raise the quality of science in the media because that's gonna help us combat a, a lot of the problems we see today, which is a lot of, I hate using the term fake news, but it's almost what we got now. We have this bad science communication going on in the media. So work with the journalists, just, be knowledgeable about the fact that you shouldn't be joking, you shouldn't be sarcastic, you shouldn't be saying silly things, you should be professional, you should be to the point. So let's talk a little bit about the, the effects of, of this, um, particularly for, for you, Jen. How do, how do the challenges of the opportunities that are outlined here sort of affect what you hear on the Hill and from members of Congress day to day, either the success stories or, or some of the junk science that gets out there? How, how does that affect what you do day to day? Uh, well, well, certainly, how and um, and how often scientists communicate with the public does impact how the the people who um, they elect consider science. So, so that's that's one component, right? Um, uh, if the public is skeptical about science, um, it's uh, it's probably true that then their member of Congress will also be skeptical about science. Now, of course, not a one-to-one -one correlation, um, but, uh, uh, but if, if in general there's positive science communication, positive engagement uh, happening in, uh, in the community, then, uh, then and, and, and members of the public have a strong um, affinity for uh, for science and and research, then that will be important potentially to them as they elect a member of Congress and a member of Congress who does not believe in uh, the tenets of uh, of scientific method and and science um, will not then be supported by by that public. It's, uh, it's complicated, and again, it's not, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, um, uh, but, um, but it is important, I think, for, um, uh, for members of the scientific community to have positive engagements with the broader community in which they reside and, and take part in, um, and, and that will inevitably have an impact on how policymakers consider science and, and the importance of, um, of supporting uh, research, particularly publicly funded research. I don't know if that quite yeah, got to your point, Brendan. 
Uh, Ed, we have a lot of people in the room who are concerned about and speaking thoughtfully about ways in which to address any expectation gap in trust in, in scientific research. Mm -hmm. The media has its own trust yeah. dynamics and issues. So, so maybe <clears throat> explain to us a little bit some, some of the trust issues that are on your mind as a, as a working reporter. Sure. You, I think this is especially true in uh, traditional uh, newspaper and uh, print media. Uh, you know, the, the New York Times has a fantastic climate desk. Uh, great, great reporting, great stuff. On their editorial, on the op-ed board, they have a, a basically a climate denier in Brett Stevens. And you know, people reading the newspaper, they don't. There's, there's not a big distinction between the editorial and the newspaper. I don't think so. I think people see the New York Times headline and they see people peddling these arguments. And you know, this, uh, this happened a lot. You know, not, it's not just climate change. There's been you know, all sorts of environmental issues throughout the decades that have been uh, sort of laundered through the editorial board of newspapers. And you know, to me, that is, uh, that is probably one of the more pressing issues within our, within our own institute. Um, you know, many more people will read the New York Times editorial than probably any piece of science reporting uh, in, you know, in a given year. And, you know, I don't know the answer to the, I don't know how to solve that, really. I don't know, you know, scientists and journalists, there, there is a, there's often an unseen enemy in that corporations and, and other institutes that, that do not care for the conclusions that are coming out of the scientific community. They are spending much more money, much more resources to combat those messages. And I think it would be prudent for both scientists and journalists to be a little bit more vocal in naming those forces. I, I think the one thing that you can actually try, I mean, when you just came in from the airport, right? When you're at the airport, they have all sorts of signs that say, you know, if you see something, say something. Well, if you see a piece of bad science and this is your field, say something about it. The solution is you can write an editorial. It doesn't have to be the New York Times. It can be in your local paper. Um, a lot of people still read local newspapers. So in your corner of the world, write an editorial to combat a bad piece of science communication that, that you've seen. Because we need more people to do that, right? What's the, I'm going to paraphrase the old quote, you know, a lie will make it halfway around the world before the truth gets its uh, shoes on. Um, you know, Andrew Wakefield published one study about vaccines and autism, and here we are almost 30 years later, and we're still fighting that fight, okay? So we need people to speak up. So, um, and it's true. Most people will read the editorials in newspapers and not the articles, which is pretty depressing if you think about it. But that's the thing that you can do. How I got started in science communication, I'll tell you my origin story if you want, because I am a superhero. Um, <laughs> I was sitting, uh, I, I was, I don't remember where I was, but I was reading this article, and it was an article that came out, it was a, it was a nutrition story, uh, and it was a, a sub-analysis of the, fr of the um, uh, Framingham uh, cohort study, actually. And uh, the study's basic thing was that strawberries were able to prevent heart disease in women. Um, and so I looked at this, and I had some epidemiology training, so I was able to look at it, and I, you know, still a, just graduated or was still in class at the time, so I was, you know, very excited to talk about the number needed to treat, because I just learned about that in class. And so I wrote an article to the Montreal Gazette, and I said, well, listen, yes, this article showed a 20% relative risk reduction, whatever that means. I said, but think of it this way. If you actually look at the numbers, the number needed to treat is something like 30,000. Uh, because of the very low event rate. So I said, so basically what this article should have said was that if you take 30,000 women, force feed them strawberries every day for two years, you will prevent one non-fatal heart attack. And when you frame the article that way, the implications for public health are probably less significant than the original, original article claimed. Um, but, and, and that's how I got started on that. That article led to others. So, uh, you know, write articles. Most of you here are used to writing. You're used to writing grants. You're used to writing scientific papers. Um, Writing for the lay media is a different skill, but it's a skill like anything else. If you start it and keep at it, you will get better at it. And being able to condense all your information to 600 words is very, very difficult. You know, there's an old joke is that if you're in a hurry, you write a long article. But if you get used to the idea of condensing your stuff down, get involved with your local newspaper or your local radio station. Most radio stations would be more than happy to know that they can call you up if they have a question and they want to do like a 15 minute hit with you or something. And I do that very frequently up in Montreal. They'll call me up and they're like, can you comment on this study showing that cleaning products causes obesity in like one year olds, which is an actual study that came out in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. And I had to explain that no, and it had nothing to do with the microbiome. It's like, 
don't worry about it. Um, but they'll be more than happy to know that you're out there. So if you make yourself available, most organizations will be m very, very happy to use you as a resource because they often don't know who to turn to. So again, I get back to my point, is that the way to combat bad headlines is when you see something, say something. Yeah, you know, uh, I have never done TV reporting, so I have, I have no knowledge in that field, but something I've noticed over the years I've been doing this is that when I write an article, it's, it's uh, surprisingly similar to the outline of a journal article. You know, there's the intro, there's, the, there's, there's relevant information, uh, you go a little bit into talking about how the study was done and, you know, what you guys found, uh, and you discuss, then you discuss limitations, and then you discuss the, the, the implications for the public. You know, that's usually the, the general frame of an article I'll write on a study. So I think scientists, they're probably better at communicating with the public than they think they are. That's a good point. So I'm gonna ask one more question, but you've, you've seen this today, so now it's your turn to say something. So I wanna give you all a minute to mobilize if you wanna approach the mics uh, and, uh, and give us your questions or comments. So in the meantime, as anybody's uh, moving forward, like a good journalist, I want to ask you if there's anything you'd like to add or emphasize or points you did not hear discussed today, anything that you think is underreported that, that should be added to the discussion before we adjourn. I, I think the thing I'd, I'd want to most emphasize, I probably have already, is that uh, people, people trust scientists. They, they do. They trust you guys more than any, almost anyone else, really. And, and they want you guys to speak up. You know, that there's been some conflicting research, but from what I understand, you know, when, when scientists advocate, it, they're not generally looked at with suspicion. You know, they, they, we guys want you to speak up, just the public in general. I'll, um, I'll throw out uh, a couple of points. I think um, uh, both of my colleagues here have made uh, the point that relationships are important. And, um, and when you develop a good relationship, you'll, you'll probably be considered a resource to, to that person, be it a journalist or another scientist or a policymaker. So building relationships is important. Um, I'll make the pitch that um, if you do plan to, um, uh, to reach out to your member of Congress, think about connecting with your campus government relations person. Um, because they can first help you make that connection and second help you prepare for that for that interaction and make the most of of that interaction um, and I will also um, make a pitch that uh, as you work with your um, uh, with your public affairs folks on campus as you reread those um, the, the press releases that they put together for the, um, the miracle breakthroughs that you've um, developed, uh, be sure you cite your funder in, uh, in those um, releases and, and in any of the, um, uh, any of the uh, releases that you might issue directly, um, particularly if your funder is a federal agency. First, it's required. Second, it helps the public recognized that this science didn't come from nothing. It came from their taxpayer dollars, that they were actually involved in, um, uh, in whatever the discovery was that you're highlighting. Um, there's an analogy we used to have on the medical ward that one of my uh, attending physicians said to us when I was a resident, is that if a medical error happens, it because, it's because there were multiple places where that error could have been stopped and we all failed. It started with the medical student, went to the resident, went to the attending, got past the nursing staff, got past the nursing supervisor, got past the pharmacist before the, that wrong medication was given to the patient, right? Multiple people saw that error and didn't act appropriately. So when an error happens, it's a system-wide failure that's happened. It's not because of any one person. So when we have bad science stories, when we have bad science communication, when we can create a notion that vaccines cause autism, it's because we had multiple points where we could have stopped and where we failed. So we have, to, we have to design good research, and a lot of what we heard earlier in the day was about how we design trials and making sure that you know, we do stuff properly, whether we blind them, whether we have randomization, all that stuff that we heard about. We have to draw the right inferences from the data, so we have to understand that p-hacking is a problem, and a surprisingly large number of researchers don't understand that. We have to communicate that science better, which means working with your university organization PR department to put out a press relief that is not unjustifiable in the language it uses. And we have to work with the journalists 
to communicate our ideas in an appropriate manner, and the journalists have to write good articles, and the editorial staff of newspapers and media companies have to write good headlines. So there's multiple places where we have to do that, and when we fail, it's because we failed all along that pathway. It's not any one single person's fault. Thank you. Go ahead. So um, those last comments notwithstanding, one of the areas you really didn't touch on that I'd, I'd like to hear your comments on are how to communicate um, in a more positive way the challenges around research reproducibility. This is not something that shines a particularly beautiful light necessarily on the scientific community. I mean, people, when we got into this space six years ago, I mean, a lot of my colleagues in the labs, you know, really got their backs up. And, um, and I can also tell you from my own personal experience when we published our economic analysis study, the famous or infamous, I should say, not necessarily famous, $28 billion um, paper, we got a tremendous amount of press, but um, a lot of that press was, we were very, very concerned. In fact, we had an entire day, my institution, we brought in consultants about how to frame the press release. The greatest fear was this is gonna just completely piss off the public and Congress and that was not our intent at all. Our intent was to shine a light on this and then provide solutions. So I'd like to hear more specific comments about how, to, how, how both from a scientific community perspective and a press perspective, we can um, really think about this in a positive way, just as we're doing actually here today. Because I think the potential for further alienating the public um, by presenting that, you know, the scientific community doesn't have their act together is, mm -hmm. is really great here. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think there, there, there tend to be two narratives in, when you're reporting on science. Uh, we found something or we, something has been reconfirmed and it's, and it's good news or uh, science screwed up, this is why. And I, I think we have to right from the beginning, just be upfront about the, the discovery process. That you know, I think people will, will understand if things go wrong if you are open about the possibility of false starts, if you are open about the mistakes you might have made in your research or, or the, the false leads you might have pursued, and, and just you know, openly reporting negative studies, I think, I think is a big part. If, if journalists reported just things that didn't work, people would appreciate the reality that that can happen, and, and it's not necessarily the end of the world. Um, the, the way I respond to that is, you know, where do you want your cockroaches? Do you want them out on the floor where you can step on them or do you want them behind the fridge where you can't see them? <laughs> no, the problem is there. And I think, we, I think we erode public confidence more if we don't deal with the problem head on. And the analogy I would draw there is like, if you have, if, I don't know how many clinicians are in the room, but if there's a medical error on the ward or with the patient, the best thing you can do is disclose it up front. It's the cover up that's worse. It's the cover-up that makes things worse. And so if we don't address the issues, it's gonna erode the public's confidence even more because then you get into a situation like what happened with the Cornell, uh, Cornell Food Lab, where you start getting these multiple retractions and these generate, these become very popular stories and the public realizes like, well, everything we've been talking about. I used a lot of those metaphors when talking about food research, right? Buy smaller plates, uh, you know, so that you don't see as much food. I said that multiple times. I, you know, I look silly now because I believed in that. So. The, the lack of reproduci reproducibility isn't just a problem for the public, but it's a problem for us because we're consumers of science as well. So the problem is there, we have to deal with it. And although it's counterintuitive to think that disclosing it to the public is a good thing, it actually probably is in the long term because we have to be better, and the only way we can be better, be better is if we make changes. The field of genetic epidemiology had a big problem with reproducibility until it became standard for them to replicate their results in two different cohorts, which is a standard now in genetic epidemiology. So, you know, if we can move towards that in other fields of research, I, you know, it, it will become the standard the minute we all agree that it is the standard. And so this is what we have to work on now in the next 10, 20 years, basically. Go ahead, please. Hi, um, I have a question about uh, popular science writing, so I guess probably for, uh, for you, Eds. Um, so how do you determine the, especially in this day and age of where you have um, almost anyone with a, with a phone can access yeah. any, anything that you wrote or most people in this room could write. So 
And you have a huge uh, variation of age ranges and education backgrounds and even just interest in not only what brings them to reading that piece, but what they hope to get out of it and what they could understand from it and, and how far you can get into the story while keeping them engaged. So how do you determine, especially when you write for, um, for, a, um, for Gizmodo, which has such a broad, right. a broad base, how, how deeply into articles you go and how much background you provide while, while simultaneously not dumbing it down too much to make, the, to make the reader feel like you're talking down to them, but also providing a sufficient um, in-depth analysis of the complex science that you're trying to talk about. Sure. You know, when, when I first started, I, I would spend graphs just, just describing the, the, the minutia of a scientific study, and I had to have it beaten out of me by other editors uh, to, just, to just get to the point. Uh, and I, I think that's also a problem scientists tend to have as well. Um, the the reader, I, I think, the reader just cares about things that that are are relevant to their lives. You know, if there's a drug coming out, uh, I, I've gotten so many emails and and comments uh, who are concerned about Alzheimer's. Uh, you know, because of their parents or because you know, they're growing up, and. You know, to me, it, it's just about the impact it will have on a person's life. That that's really the. I think that's the 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 most clear metric I have when I choose a, a study or something to write about. And from there, it, it's just like how, if I was explaining it to my mother, how would I, how would I do that? That's, that's generally the frame line, just like the average person, what would they want to know? Uh, what should they know? And, you know, what, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. With the U.S. has a very heterogeneous population, and I'm just curious if there are guidelines for writing stories, sort of diff different populations. Like you mentioned Congress likes anecdotes. Well, they're all lawyers and the law is made on anecdotes, so I guess there's no surprise there. But, uh, um, you know, we have different ethnic backgrounds, different educational levels, and uh, just curious if there are, you talk among yourselves or guidelines about how you deal yeah. with that heterogeneity. Yeah. No, there really aren't. The, the short answer to the question is no. There are no real guidelines to how you, you do that. Most people will tell you that when you write an article, aim it for like a, a sixth grade level. That's the vocabulary against which most people usually communicate. Um, so if you're too technical, uh, you will lose a vast majority of your audience. The thing to remember too is that even experts in their field are experts in their field and may not be experts in anything else. Right. Um, more often than not, people who are experts in their field are the easiest to fool because they forget that they're not experts in everything else. So I have a friend, I have a friend of mine, and I'll, be, I'll tell you another anecdote. See, I'm using anecdotes to convey information. <laughs> ah. My friend is a um, nephrologist, and we were, having a, we were meeting for coffee one day, and we got a, a muffin to, to have with our coffee. And she said, I'll have the GMO muffin, please. And I said, you know, Christina, GMO foods, there's nothing there. I mean, it's mainly a marketing device. And I've written many articles about how genetically modified foods, people have tried to use that label in a, as a way to scare people into buying more expensive products. And I said, look, there's really no, there's, there's really no good health evidence that buying you know, GMO or non-GMO foods is, is, is healthier for you. And she said to me, yeah, but you know what? I buy that for my kids. You know why? Because I want my kids to be healthy. And when you're a parent, you'll see, you'll do the same. Now, I'm not a parent, and hopefully I won't do that. But, you know, we are, we are experts, and my friend is an expert in her field. She's, she's a nephrologist. She knows what she's doing. But because she doesn't do critical science communication the way I do, she had never really looked at the topic of GMO food, so she was just reading the headlines, as many people do when they read the headlines, was aware of this controversy surrounding, surrounding GMO foods, and was afraid of them. And, you know, not afraid, afraid, but she was concerned about it. And she decided, I have the disposable income. Let me spend this little bit of extra money and buy the quote unquote safer product for my children, which is not an unnatural reflex for somebody to have. So, you know, when we write for the public, yes, we have people who are more educated, less educated, people who are wealthier, less wealthier. Yes, we have a heterogeneous population. But a lot of that tends to come out in the wash. And so when you're writing about general science topics of which people are not experts, you may not be at a very different level than you know, a, a, another member of the general public that has no background in science whatsoever. So I, I don't tend to tailor my articles, really. I tend to write for the widest possible audience possible, and I just sort of hope for the best. Okay, that's great. Let's take a final question. <clears throat> Um, so considering uh, that journalism and uh, newspapers, magazines are scrapping for their lives right yeah. now and uh, 
they, they have a goal of trying to really sell a, a headline. And you talked earlier about the trust that scientists should have when uh, speaking to journalists. Um, how do we how do we sort of navigate that and yeah. knowing that the the most interesting stories uh, may not be the ones that get passed along or they just don't get sold to the public in the way that is most compelling and digestible? Right. I don't know. Um, <laughs> no, I mean it is. You know, people talk about the the state of science. I, I do think the, the state of journalism is uh, it's a very very worrying thing. I would be more worried about being a journalist in five years than being a scientist in five years. Um, I, I think I've seen, a lot, I've seen a lot of work on uh, scientists sort of coming together and building their own uh, journalistic outfits and organizations uh, and, and coordinating with, uh, with newspapers and uh, sort of making their own inroads in communication. Because I, I do think it is getting harder to, to reach out to traditional media. Uh, but I do think people are willing to listen to sources that are outside of the New York Times and outside of the, the traditional avenues. And I think scientists would do well to start getting involved in those uh, outside sources. Uh, we, we have a fundamental problem in our society is that we want good journalism, but we're equally unwilling to pay for it. Right? The minute there's a paywall on an article, you are not going to reach for your credit card to buy that article. You won't, right? And this is a major problem. Now, to be fair, the, the media, the traditional media, industry, like the newspapers, should have seen the internet coming. Um, they didn't really evolve fast enough, and I think the better ones are scrambling now. The New York Times is probably one example that seems to be doing more or less okay in the digital age, but you know the democratization of the internet has been a bit of a mixed blessings. It means anybody can just put something up there for free, and so you have respectable publications that have high operating costs trying to compete with fly-by-night operations that have no operating costs with no real concern about how accurate their, their data is. So, I mean, the, the easy answer to your question, at least from my perspective, is that if, you, if we want good journalism, you have to support it, either locally or nationally. I would say the local news, your local newspaper is probably the one that's most in danger of, of dying out in the next few years. We have local newspapers dying in Canada, not in the big cities yet, but in medium-sized cities. I mean, Guelph, Ontario is maybe not a big city, but it's a sizable population. And when you no longer have a local media presence in a city, who's now doing the stories on municipal affairs? You know, who's going to look into the stories of municipal corruption? I mean, I'm talking politics now, but, you know, we need to have this local media presence. It's important, and I don't think anybody has a good idea of what we're going to do. Um, so, you know, I think it's important when you have a panel like this to end on the most pessimistic note possible. <laughs> so, um, the end is nigh. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Chris, Jen, and oh, Ed. Was, was that actually the end? I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say we're all going to drag ourselves over to the reception and, and commiserate with one another. No, but can we all uh, join together in a round of applause for our, our panelists?